Welcome to episode nine of I Thought I Knew How, a podcast about knitting and life and all sorts. I'm your host, Anne Frost, and this episode was recorded on May 31st, 2019. Today I'd like to talk to you about Swatch 3, forever Swatch 3, of the Master Hand Knitter program. The winner of the last giveaway and what's in the next giveaway, a few thoughts, a knit along in favor of a great cause, Massachusetts sheep and wool craft, and more, plus of course some music to knit by. We had a great giveaway in our last episode. This is all stuff that was donated to me for my listeners, and people were kind enough to send things for me too, so I can testify that it really is all great. There's a hank of silk noil from Dragonfly Fibers. I'm using my hank to knit a shawl, which you can see on my Ravelry or Instagram accounts. There's a device stand from Knit Companion. Did any of you download the app and give it a try? I'm curious how people like it. I'm still really digging it. The issue of knitwear from spring summer 2018. This was an accidental donation. Interweave was selling back issues of their magazines for $2 each a few weeks ago, and I ordered a bunch of them for myself. And when they arrived, someone else's order was included with mine. So I emailed them and they said just to keep the other order and they'd send her new ones. So (laughs) there were three extra magazines and I already ordered two of them for myself. So those two are going to go into giveaways. Bank error in our favor, right? And of course, the set of stitch markers from my remaining inventory. So let me get my little paper here with our winner on it. As of Friday, before I sat down to record, we had 433 entries and Siri picked number 403, which was for Sparky136 on Ravelry who entered by offering some knitting advice for beginners on the Ravelry thread for episode 8. So congratulations, Sparky136. You should hear from me through Ravelry. Please check your private messages there and get back to me as soon as possible so I can send you your goodies. And remember that you have 30 days to get back to me or the giveaway will go on to someone else. I will have another giveaway at the end of the episode, so keep listening for that. In the last episode, I was pretty confident in my seed stitch for Swatch 3 of the Knitting Guild Association's Master Hand Knitter program, and I sat down and knit my swatch in an evening, and it looked good to me. But when I came back to it the following day with fresh eyes, I realized I could do better. I do think I have it. I think my seed stitch is looking pretty good. There are only two spots where I think the space between the stitches is too large, which is a definite improvement, and my gauge for this swatch is more in line with what it should be. I am overall pleased. However, the cast on edge was a little too tight, and as I worked the swatch, my gauge loosened up ever so slightly. So I'm going to give this one another go this week and see if I can get it truly blocked and done and be ready to move on. We'll see. (laughs) Someone asked me on Instagram the other day how I was liking the program, and I think my answer was something like, It's infuriating in a good way. (laughs) I really am learning a lot as I go through it, but it's also made me so hyper aware of any little deviation from the ideal that I can't help but continue to hold myself to a higher standard. And that's making the progress much slower than I'd hoped. But we are almost done with school and I only have a few more small projects to deal with for my day job. So I'm optimistic that I'll be able to get quite a bit done over the summer. In the meantime... One of the projects I'm working on is proving to be a good practice project for the program. It's a small baby blanket called Alex's Blanket designed by Aurora Knit and is available on Ravelry. It's a simple knit blanket worked from the bottom up that uses a collection of simple knit patterns like garter stitch, stockinette, seed stitch, and eyelets. There's some eyelet rows. And I've needed to get some baby blankets worked up for some of the babies on the way at church. And with this pattern... I'm able to kill two birds with one stone. I'm getting the gifts made while also practicing my tension and consistency in these basic stitches over large areas. In fact, um, I'd go so far as to say that if you're considering doing the Master Hand Knitter program, this would be a good project to do to test the waters. You would want to do it and pay really close attention to the consistency of your stitches as you work it. And you wouldn't need to be perfect, but you'd need to be able to handle that hyper awareness that comes along with being part of the program. So if you try Alex's blanket and 
are just aware of what you're knitting and you find that having to be that aware of your stitches is making you nuts, then maybe now is not the time to start the program. But if you see it as a challenge or if you find the process enlightening, then maybe it is time for you to take the plunge. I have quite a few listeners out there who have said to me either on Ravelry or through Instagram that they've been thinking about taking the Master Hand Knitter program. And I think this project would be a good way to sort of gauge your patience level as to whether you should take that step right now. Before we get too deep into this show, let's take a quick break and listen to a song. This one is from a fellow in Alberta, Canada called Doug Hoyer. It reminds me of a song that you'd hear in a Taika Waititi or Wes Anderson film. It's a little quirky, tells a little story, and I like it and I hope you will too. This is Things That I'll Keep by Doug Hoyer. Paper and change, wrappers from bubble gum. But up on the top shelf, there's a ticket for a plane. The one we were both in, where we learned each other's names. I'm looking forward to my time freeing up a little so I can catch up to where I want to be with the program. 
I feel like I've been catching up on quite a bit recently. When we moved overseas, I sort of checked out of the online knitting community. I was still knitting in the Philippines, but not as much. I would check out the new issues of Knitty when they were released, and I'd knit a project every few months, usually something decorative for the house or a gift for people back in the U.S. Um, I did do a couple of sweaters for one of my daughters who wanted to cosplay as Mabel from Gravity Falls. For those of you who don't know Mabel, she's voiced by Christian Schaal, and her character is always drawn wearing these amazingly positive sweaters with unicorns and flowers and whatever on them, so those were fun to knit. But my knitting was a hobby that largely fell by the wayside when we lived in the tropics. <laughs> I wasn't listening to any knitting podcasts or following any blogs. And when we got back to the U.S., so much had changed in the knitting community. When I left, everyone was still knitting clapo tea. <laughs> In fact, many of the hot patterns that swept through the knitting community came from Knitty because it was the best source of free fashionable patterns online. Designers were still, for the most part, competing for spots in print. I knew of maybe four or five designers total who had their own websites and were trying to sell their own patterns themselves. Not that there weren't more, just that they weren't widely known. Ravelry was only a year old. I've talked before about how new the idea of decorative stitch markers were when we moved. Bags designed specifically for your knitting were the hot and possibly only indulgence item for knitters at the time. It really is amazing to see how far things have come in the last 10 years, but I feel very much behind the times. So I thought I'd re-educate myself. Like Steve Rogers coming out of a deep freeze, I decided to consume some of the media of the past to get myself caught up to the present. So I downloaded a boatload of knitting podcasts to listen through. I didn't bother with Cast On because I was a big fan ages ago and I did listen to it to the point that Brenda Dane stopped the show. Does anyone out there remember a show by a man in Australia in the White Mountains? I can't remember the name of his show and I think he was still going when I stopped listening to podcasts. I would love to listen to his show again. If you know, please drop me a line and let me know what it was called. I cannot remember. He was one of the early knitting podcasters, so maybe someone out there remembers who he was. And Ready, Set, Knit, I got caught up with immediately when we got back to the U.S. because that's the Web's podcast. You have to listen to the Web's podcast. All that said, I searched for knit and knitting in my podcast app, and I went to the oldest shows I could find and started downloading. And I've been listening my way forward through knitting history starting in 2005 with KnitCast. A lot of them are still interesting to listen to. A lot of the podcasts are still listed in the directories, but when you try to download them, the files aren't actually there anymore. Once you pay to host a podcast on a hosting site, if you stop paying the bill, those files will disappear. So unless they decided to keep paying for a decade or they hosted on one of the few free options that were out there then, the ability to access those files is over. <laughs> There are quite a few of the earlier podcasts that only have three or four episodes before they stopped. And due to how they used to charge for bandwidth use, there are a lot of podcasts with episode numbers approaching 100 or more that only have the last five or so episodes available. Novice podcasters who didn't have sponsorship used to live in fear of suddenly catching on because their monthly hosting bill was based on how many megabytes of files their listeners downloaded rather than just being charged to host the file, so podcasters would delete old episodes to keep their bill manageable. In some of these early podcasts, hosts would actually encourage listeners to burn the episodes to CDs and pass them around. This would also ensure that you'd always have access to a copy of older episodes if they had to take them down. I've listened my way well into 2009, which is after we left the U.S., but my passage through knitting history is going to slow down considerably because more and more people began to podcast. But I'm already starting to hear the names of new designers who arrived after I stopped paying attention, and certain designs I hadn't heard of are being mentioned across various podcasts, so I am getting caught up, slowly but surely. This is something I'll continue to do, moving my way through the history I missed, and I'll get fluent in the lingo of the modern knitter. <laughs> Maybe I'll even knit some of the patterns I missed when they were the new hot thing, but as I go through all these old podcasts, I can't help but feel a little sad for the ones that have disappeared. Each podcaster has a different take on the craft and wove their personal experiences through their episodes, and they're gone now. 
It might not seem so important to think about, but as someone who stepped away from the larger knitting community for almost a decade, it's really fascinating to be able to look back and watch it develop into what it is now. And how many times have we seen a bit of design or technique that's been around for a hundred or more years and wondered what that person who came up with it was thinking? These podcasts may seem frivolous or lighthearted now, but what about 50 years from now or a hundred years? Just 10 years later and the podcasts from 2009 feel like oral histories. Maybe the early podcasters who asked their listeners to burn the files to CDs were on to something. Oral histories, written histories, journals, they're so valuable to future generations. I have a transcript of my grandmother's journal. She started it not knowing that a few months later she'd meet my grandpa, and she ended up recording their courtship in it. As their grandchild, I love having that record. I know my mother kept a journal, but at some point she threw it out. I feel that loss now that she's gone. My husband's grandfather lived in Mexico at the turn of the century and recorded his boyhood stories. My own kids loved hearing their great-grandpa talk about growing up in the desert with no electricity or car. It's one thing to read historical fiction or the speculation of a historian about how things were. It's entirely different to read the words of someone who experienced it. I hope we all have the confidence to value our personal experiences enough to write them down or record them. Use your phone to record some memories, either as audio files or notes, or get a notebook and keep it with you. Don't worry about keeping it chronological. Just write about memories as they come to you and try to write in a contemporary journal at least once a week. I'll try to be better about this too. What seems mundane now will help someone in the future to get caught up. In the meantime, if you'd like to take a walk down the memory lane of knitting history, Cast On is still out there, as well as Knit Cast, and maybe listen to Knit Obsession with Z Knits. In future episodes, as I continue with this little project of mine, I'll let you know as I find other podcasts that still hold up. I've talked before about the Shetland MRI scanner appeal, a fundraising effort to get an MRI machine for the hospital on Shetland so that the residents don't have to travel to the mainland for this basic medical test. They are hoping to raise 2 million pounds, and as of the last time I checked, they'd raised about 7% of that goal. Well... A wonderful thing has happened to get things moving along. Harriet Middleton, a resident of Shetland, has been selling knitted goods to raise funds since the beginning of the appeal, but recently she designed a Fair Isle hat using the colors of the appeal's logo, and her son Billy, who works for NHS Shetland, put the hat in pattern form for us, and the funds from the sale of the pattern are going to the scanner appeal. Additionally, people have been volunteering to knit the hats to sell, with the proceeds going to the cause. As I prepared this podcast, they were approaching 2,500 patterns sold, and the demand for pre-made hats has been outstripping their ability to produce them. I imagine that by the time this episode releases, they will have passed 2,500. It is amazing to see what knitters can do when they organize behind a cause. And now, there is a knit-along being sponsored by the Minnesota Knitters Guild. You do not need to be a member of the guild to join. You can search for their group on Ravelry and find the thread about the knit along or visit the show notes for the episode at ithoughtinewhow.familypodcast.com and I'll have the link to the details there. The knit along starts on June 8th, which is Worldwide Knit in Public Day, and it ends on July 20th, so you have over a month to take part. If you cast on by June 15th and post a photo to the group, then you will be entered into a drawing to win four of the guild's patterns, and those who finish and post a picture by July 20th will be entered into a drawing to win some knitting ebooks. To participate, you will need to buy the pattern. Right now, it's four pounds or a little over five dollars on Ravelry. You just need to search for Harriet's hat. 100% of the pattern price is donated toward the MRI. However, once you have the pattern, you're welcome to stash dive for the yarn or buy it locally. But if you are in need of yarn, a couple of online shops have put together kits. The WoollyThistle.com has the kits at a 10% discount and is giving the profits from the kits to the appeal as well. If you are local to Northfield Yarn in Northfield, Minnesota, you can get a kit in the store. Minnesota Knitting Guild members get 10% off the price of the kit, or you can order it from their online store. I'll have links in the show notes. 
I was chatting with Billy the other night and learned that there's actually enough yarn in the kits to knit two hats, so keep that in mind. I bought the pattern the first day it released, and I was able to get a kit from the Woolly Thistle, so I'll be casting on on June 8th, and I hope you'll join me. Remember, all the links you'll need to join in will be in the show notes for episode 9 at I thought I knew how.familypodcast.com. So the girls and I made it to the Massachusetts Sheep and Wool Craft Festival at the Cummington Fairgrounds. It was a bit of an adventure to get there because we missed some detour signs and ended up at a closed bridge in the middle of the woods. <laughs> in an area where my phone had no coverage at all, but we were able to find a couple of helpful strangers who pointed us in the right direction. The festival felt smaller than the Connecticut Sheep Wool and Fiber Festival, but I did not mind this as it gave us more time to interact with some of the vendors and the other folks wandering around. There were three barns and an outside area with vendors, two barns with sheep, a good-sized area of food trucks, and an area for hands-on crafting and demonstrations. There were also sheepdog trials going on the entire day. Those are always fun to watch. My oldest split away immediately and spent the entire time needle felting at a demonstration table. That was a new experience for her, so I was glad she found another craft she likes. My youngest and I worked our way through the booths. We met Knits for Comfort, who is a indie dyer who has some really fun colorways and some lovely patterns designed for her yarns. I picked up a neat project for me and each of the girls. She sells these kits to knit a liner for a travel mug. It's so cute and I love it. It took an evening to work it up and now I have this fun little one-of-a-kind mug that is, best of all, machine washable. <laughs> Later on, we ran into listener knitting travels. It was such a treat to get to talk to someone who doesn't already know me. <laughs> I'm still a little amazed that anyone listens to me ramble on about my chosen nerdery. Anyway, Knitting Travels gets up to some really interesting things and has an eye for photography, so look for her on Instagram. She and her friends pointed me to some knitting clubs that are in my area, so I'm doing my best to make contact with them now that I know that they do exist and are not just the stuff of rumor. <laughs> we made our way to the sheep, and my youngest made good friends with Achieviet that did not want her to stop scratching her head. <laughs> In the barns, they had grooming stands set up for the sheep, and their keepers were giving them trims in preparation for their judging. It was so fun to watch because they'd take care of their bodies first and leave their lower legs until the last minute, so they all ended up temporarily looking like poodles. <laughs> we finished off by spending some time with the Shetland sheep. They are really so tiny compared to the others. I was lucky to get away without one of my girls smuggling one into the back seat of the car. <laughs> Really, though, I am lucky we got out of there without an Angora rabbit because there were a few people there who were selling kits for $20 each. And my kids were making the case that with the price of Angora yarn being what it was, I could easily make my money back by raising the bunny myself. Uh, no. <laughs> Even if I wanted to, our lease only allows for one pet and we already have our dog. So no, sorry, kids. If you can make it next year, I would suggest a few things. First of all, print out a paper map, <laughs> just in case. You never know if you're going to encounter a bridge that's out. Uh, the second thing I would say is to show up with your budget in cash. There were quite a few honest-to-goodness farmers who were there that only sell at fairs and only took cash. And even some of the people who were taking cards were having a hard time with the Wi-Fi. And like I said, there is no cell service in the area to speak of. So other than that, I'd say just to show up ready to interact. It was really just a joyful way to spend a morning. Now that we're done talking about joyful days at Fiber Fairs, we're going to listen to some blues. <laughs> I don't have anything about the musician behind this song. The site where I got the rights to it says that the artist is Neil Cross, but when I searched for him, the only person who came up on Google was the fellow who wrote Luther for BBC One, and I'm guessing they're not the same person. Anyway, the lyrics were written by Langston Hughes in 1934 as The Ballad of Roosevelt, but sadly I have no info on who wrote the music or performed the song. This is a very annoying oversight music licensing company. <laughs> I will have to be more careful about the songs I pick in the future so I can give the artist proper credit, but this really is a great listen. Let's enjoy it. It's called Waiting On. The pot was empty, the cupboard was bare. I said, Papa, why? 
What's the matter here? I'm waiting, son. Waiting on Roosevelt. I'm waiting on Roosevelt. The rent was due and the lights was out. I said, tell me, mama, what's it all about? Where, where?
All right, a few more things before I go. One of the ways to enter the last giveaway was to give some advice to a listener who was struggling to move beyond beginner level into some more advanced techniques. And I really liked the responses we got, so I thought I'd share them for those of you who aren't on Ravelry. Angelic Ember said, My best advice is it is okay to make mistakes. Keep trying because you will get it. Also, buying a stitch counter really helped me at first, and starting my first projects by watching different YouTube tutorials for beginners helps me tremendously. Also, it's better to start the first projects with larger needles and yarn. It's easier to see the stitches while getting a feel for knitting totally agree with angelic embers here a lot of the times newbies will see kits or projects that require you know a sport yarn or fingering and they just love the project and they want to knit that thing and so they opt for that small yarn small needle project and don't realize how much easier it would have been if they had started with a bulky or a worsted and then picked up that smaller project so i think that's a great piece of advice Feminista said, my advice for beginners is to be intrepid. I know so many knitters who are afraid to go for the techniques and patterns that look difficult because they think it is beyond their skill level. And so they spend 20 years knitting garter stitch baby blankets, which sounds mind numbing to me. The truly wonderful thing about knitting is that if you start something and it doesn't work, you can unravel and make something else. This was a revelation. Knitting allows for experimentation and second chances, and there is no shame in ripping back or just frogging it all and starting something new because the attempt itself, even if aborted, has built skills, and you can still use the yarn for something else. And the hard stuff can be really fun. It's exhilarating to tackle something just to see if you can do it because when you are successful, you feel like a superhero. Again, really good advice. I love the point where she says that even trying something will help build your skills, even if you fail at it the first time. That's true in so many things. I took a programming class in college and we would have an assignment a week and I would spend all week trying to get that program to compile and just would get so many error messages. And finally, you know, an hour before class in a panic, I would just delete it all and then rewrite it from scratch and it would work fine. (laughs) because along the way I had figured out how to do it. I had learned the skills and that really is, I think that's true with so many things that as we try them, we learn the skills that we need. And so sometimes you just have to stand back and give it one more try and it clicks. So just keep going, just keep trying, don't give up. Ari Cowell said, When I got back into knitting, I kept a bookmark for Very Pink Knits. She has great videos on how to do almost everything, and I have even emailed her questions, and she is very responsive and helpful. During my last cable sweater, I found myself wandering onto her page for tips and some of the finishing I wanted to make sure I got right. YouTube is definitely a lifesaver. I very much agree with this uh, advice, Ari Cowles and Angelic Embers. As I shared before, my mom's the one who taught me to knit, but in the... This modern world that we have, my mom and I lived apart the entire time that I knew how to knit. You know, it finally, it didn't click with me until after I moved out of the house and I lived across the country and then across the planet. So even though she got me started, when I needed help with something, I turned to YouTube. That's how I learned all the larger techniques, all the harder techniques that have to do with knitting. So YouTube is amazing. It's an amazing resource. Sparky136, the winner of our giveaway, said, My advice for a new knitter is to learn to read your knitting, learn to tell your knits and pearls, also use stitch markers and lifelines. That is very helpful to be able to read your knits and pearls. The knits, of course, look like little V's underneath your needles, and the pearls look like a horizontal line. And being able to keep track of them in those beginner patterns can be very, very helpful. It's essential sometimes. Uh, and some patterns to be able to tell them. And then stitch markers and lifelines, when you start getting into some of the trickier knitting, there's nothing that's going to help you more than stitch markers and lifelines. Stitch markers can be very useful when you're working on repeated stitch patterns. So if you have a stitch pattern with a 10 or 15 or 20 stitch repeat, you can put a stitch marker between each of those repeats. And then as you're working the row across, if you're working that repeat of the pattern and you finish the repeat and you haven't made it to the stitch marker yet, or maybe you don't finish the repeat before you get to the stitch marker, you can stop and look back over your knitting 
just in that section and find the mistake that you made and fix it instead of having to go all the way back across the row and figure out where you missed it. So it makes it far less infuriating (laughs) when you're trying to get into some of these harder techniques if you have it grouped in smaller chunks across the way. And then of course, a lifeline is when you run a bit of scrap yarn through the stitches of a row. So you get to a certain point, you know that you have done the work to that point properly and you can take a piece of scrap yarn on a darning needle and just run it through all of the stitches that are on your needle and pull it through and just have it there so that as you progress if you do need to rip out your knitting you can rip it out with confidence knowing that when you get to that lifeline that you put in you will stop ripping out you won't lose the stitches beyond that point and then you can run your needle back through and continue from there if you have interchangeable needles a lot of them actually have a hole that runs through them so that when you're ready to put your lifeline in you can thread it through that hole knit the row And the needle, the hole in the needle will carry that thread through the row for you. And then you can just pull it out of the hole when you finish that row. So that's a really easy way to run your lifeline. Then we have Dee Dee Thurber. She said, my advice to a new knitter is as soon as you are comfortable with knits and pearls, take a class on reading your knitting and correcting your mistakes. That is a really helpful piece of advice. That's something that I learned through trial and error was figuring out how to identify where my mistakes were in the pattern. But there are um, a lot of knitting stores will offer this as a class, like how to spot mistakes and then how to go back without having to rip back, how to drop a stitch from the top and fix the thing that's wrong and then bring that stitch back up. Very, very handy. If you are feeling adventurous and like you maybe don't need a class, you just need some guidance on how to make a correction like that. There's a book called Knit to Fix by Lisa Cartis that is published by Interweave Press that is very handy in this regard and it will tell you how to change a knit to a purl or how to rip back in a cable and fix an area where you crossed it the wrong way and then work that cable back up to where you are. It's really handy to be able to no longer have to rip back everything when you find one mistake or a few mistakes in your knitting and just be able to correct them quickly and easily. It's really a good skill to have. Hannah's All Good on Instagram added, Advice for a beginning knitter such as myself, if I was starting over, I would have bought a set of interchangeable circular needles so that you are bound to have needles for almost any project. I've probably spent the same or more buying individual circulars, and knowing how into knitting I am now, I would have been better off with a set. The benefits of hindsight, eh? So I thought this was a great piece of advice. I I kind of wish I had done that myself because I have so many knitting needles now. I didn't even know about interchangeable knitting needles until I was well into my knitting career. (laughs) So I have tons of circulars. I have a full set. I have a couple full sets of straight needles. So interchangeable needles for those who might be new. You get a package that has the tips, usually from a four to a 10, 10 and a half, 11. I've seen some that go as high as 13 uh, needle. And then you have a collection of different cord lengths and you can take the cord and attach the needle tips to the ends of the cord. And then you have knitting needles in the size that you need. And the really cool thing about interchangeable needles is if you need those tips for another project, they often come with little stoppers. So you can unscrew the needle tips so you can unscrew the needle tips and attach the little stoppers and the your project will be safe on the cord while you use the while you use the needle tips on another project. At first, the kits can be quite expensive, but when you start adding up the different costs of buying multiple needles, you really do end up uh, spending less on getting an interchangeable needle set. I would really recommend if you do this though, that you try out several kinds and find the set that works best for you before you invest the money. And I would not buy it right away. I would probably, if you are a true beginner, I would say wait until you're on your third or fourth project just to make sure that you really do enjoy knitting 
before you then invest in the interchangeable set. The next bit of advice comes from Wolfjoy, who added, My overall advice for a new knitter would be to forget straight needles, go immediately to circulars, and if you can, get a starter-priced interchangeable set, or even just parts of the set, like Denise or Knit Picks. When you get around to upgrading, these are also excellent to start your kids or grandkids on. Why? Circulars take all the weird weight off the end of the needle so you don't feel like you're battling with it while trying to make the pointy end do what you want. Plus, you're not fighting with the needle end going up your sleeve or whacking yourself in the forearm. Also, it's so much easier to save your knitting when you have to set it down for a few minutes or a month. (laughs) So I would totally agree with this. I usually use circular needles myself, and the other day I used a pair of my straight needles for the first time in a long time. Now when I use straight needles, I tend to use very short ones for small projects. I don't use the long ones, but the other day, for some reason, I grabbed a pair of my long ones and was using them. And it really is true that when your project's large enough, it starts to really weigh down the far end of your needle. And it oh, I, for, I forgot how much work that is on my hands. And in fact, ever since I was working on the project on those straights, my right arm has really been giving me grief. So it really does make a difference. Panushka also agreed. She said that for a beginner, an interchangeable needle set is very helpful, or two sets. <laughs> one set with smaller needles for socks, lace shawls, and one set with medium and bigger needle tips for the most of the knitting projects. So again, we're getting a lot of suggestions for interchangeables. And then we have B. Leah D. 92, who said, I am a new knitter myself, but have crocheted for over 10 years. From experience, I can say that chart reading just takes practice. I know it sucks, but unfortunately, that is the best and only way to really master charts. Over time, you will memorize the symbols and it will become second nature. As far as general advice, I second Very Pink Knits. Her videos are fantastic and very informative. Plus, between all her videos and her podcast, I don't think there is a knitting topic she hasn't covered. Hope this helps. Leah. I will agree. Very Pink Knits has been around for a long time. In fact, as I'm working through knitting podcasts, um, I'm starting to get to the point where I'm getting to Very Pink Knits. And she is also one of my favorite people to watch on YouTube because she has been around for quite a long time now. And she does have an extensive collection of uh, tutorial videos. So you cannot go wrong with her. And finally, we have one last tip from Nicole S., I agree with the people who are saying don't be scared to try new things. I would add that it helps to start with a yarn where you can see your stitches. I know quite a few people who learned to knit those little ruffled scarves out of novelty yarn and never got beyond garter stitch because using something where they couldn't see what was going on made shaping intimidating. That is very true. And not just shaping, but just knitting in general, being able to differentiate the stitches with fun fur or those types of novelty yarns, they really can be very difficult. Sometimes when you are working a project and you have all your stitches on your needle and you need to slide it along the needle, so you're kind of shoving at your project, sliding it up or down, and your stitches end up overlapping. When you're using those novelty yarns, it's hard to see that the stitches are overlapping. So you end up inadvertently doing a knit two together instead of just, you know, it's really easy to separate them. When you see that they've overlapped, you can just take your finger and just pull them apart again. But if you can't differentiate the stitches, you don't know to do that. And so you end up with projects that grow inward. Another thing that sometimes happens is when knitters turn their work, if you have your yarn around the needle to the back, it can take that first stitch and pull it to the back and make it look like two stitches. And so you have to make sure that you have it forward and down and that will pull the stitch downward and you'll see it's just one. That's kind of hard to explain. I hope that you understand. Probably people who have been knitting for a while understand what I'm talking about and unfortunately the new knitters don't. But just trust me, you want to make sure that you have your yarn going in the right direction so you're not pulling those two stitches across uh, the one stitch up and over and making it look like two stitches. And again, that's something that when it's easier to see if you're using like a worsted spun yarn rather than a uh, novelty type yarn, you can't see that you've done that so easily. When that happens, that's that's usually the cause with, when you're a new knitter and you have a project that keeps growing wider. That's I find that's usually what's happened. Anyway, I don't know how much, whether that made sense to our poor newbies but maybe I'll take some pictures and show and have it in the show notes. Finally, 
We're at our finally, everyone. You know I've got another giveaway for you. This one is a collection of items from the Mass Sheep and Woolcraft Festival. I tried this time to focus mainly on items from people who do not sell in stores or online so that it truly is a giveaway that's unique to the festival. First... From a farmer who didn't even have a name on her booth. She was just there selling what she had. She wasn't worried about branding. She had some hand-sewn sachets to repel moths that are filled with lavender cloves and rosemary. I got a couple for myself to go. uh, One goes in the bin I stored my knits in over the summer, and the other one went into the chest that holds my wool, and I got one for the giveaway. They also had small paper bags full of hand-dyed robing. It smells delightfully sheepy and has been dyed. The one I got has been dyed blue, green, and yellow. It has not been carded at all. So this is something that would be good to use for needle felting, or maybe if you're a spinner and you'd like to do the carding and spin it up, you'd probably get a a good length of lace weight from it. It even has some vegetable matter in it, and (laughs) the tips of the wool are still in locks, but the colors are beautiful, and you can see a photo of it in the show notes or on Instagram. And then I have a taster hank from from Patricia Fortinsky of Tidal Yarns. She only sells at festivals, so I have her card as well in case you end up loving it and want to buy some directly from her. And I also have a pair of felted acorns from Englishman Bay Trading Company. They are super cute. And they do actually sell online and they have these neat little wooden sheep that you can wind robing around and they sell woven woolen blankets. But even though they have an online shop, I really thought their acorns were adorable. So I went ahead and got those. I'll throw in a set of stitch markers from my remaining inventory and we will call this a giveaway. Now, sadly, this giveaway is going to be for the U.S. only. The last winter was overseas and the postage rates for international shipping have increased quite a bit from the last time I sent a package overseas. So for now, the giveaways are going to go to being for the U.S. only. However, you all should know by now that I travel quite a bit. So as I end up on trips to various places, I will make future giveaways apply to other regions of the world. So don't give up. There will likely be a giveaway for your area in the next year. This giveaway is going to be Instagram-based, so to enter, you will need to find the post for the episode. The second picture in that post will show the giveaway items so that you can see them. Make sure you are following I Thought I Knew How on Instagram, like the post, and tag as many people as you want in the comments with one tag per comment. Share the post on your grid or in your stories and be sure to tag me so I see it and I'll give you five entries. Okay, so once more, sadly, this is only open to people with a U.S. mailing address. Follow me on Instagram. That's one entry. Find and like the episode post for episode nine. That's another entry. And then tag one friend per comment for one entry each. And if you share it on your grid or feed and tag me, I will give you five entries. I'll pick the winner on June 14th and announce the winner in episode 10. In the meantime, thank you for listening and knitting with me for a bit. If you would like to contact me, you can email me at anne at familypodcasts.com. That's anne with an E at familypodcast.com. I'm on Ravelry, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube as I thought I knew how. If it's a place that allows you to put spaces between the words, then there are spaces between the words. Otherwise, it's all one word. The Facebook and Ravelry groups are both called I Thought I Knew How Podcast. I'm on Twitter as at Thought I Knew How. The website for the show is I Thought I Knew How Podcast.com. There you will find the show notes for each episode. Every now and then I post a blog post there too. I posted a really ranty one the other day, so you might want to find that one and read it. <laughs> Only if you're in a ranty mood too, though. Please consider joining the Knit Along for Harriet's Hat to help raise money for the Shetland MRI Scanner Appeal. There will be a link in the show notes for that. If you are a musician or no one and would like to have a song featured on the program, drop me an email and point me to where I can hear your music. You do need to be the copyright owner to be able to grant permission, so please keep that in mind. Until next time, may you be blessed with stitches that never drop, yarn without joins, and plenty of time to knit. <laughs>